everybody. Uh, I'm Lior Shapiro uh, with Jefferies. I've been with the firm for eight years. I run our capital intelligence team. Uh, the majority of that team is focused on the cap intro side. It's a big reason why, why we're all here today. Um, first and foremost, just want to thank the team at iConnections. They've, uh, they've been great partners for us. We've been with them since the beginning. And I, and I think like any good trade, you, you want to be early to it. I think we were. Uh, and I think we're, we're reaping the benefits and, and really just pleased to be the, uh, the, the title sponsor here today. For, for this panel, uh, it's taken a lot of persistence uh, on my part and others at Jefferies, but we finally got Rich here. Uh, he's the CEO of the firm. He's been with the firm for 30 years, uh, 30 plus years, uh, 20 of those years being the chairman and, and the CEO of our firm. And, and I think, you know, or what I hope you all get out of this is, is sort of how humble, how approachable, how family oriented uh, he is, the kind of leader he is, uh, a really great person to work for, uh, who's given us all a lot of duration uh, to kind of execute on, on the strategies within our respective businesses at the firm. So really pleased to have him here. I won't say too much because I want you to hear from him uh, directly. Saul Kuman uh, will, be, will be moderating this panel. Saul, uh, very distinguished career. Uh, arrived about 10 minutes ago, cutting it a little bit close for this panel, but, but he's ready to go. He's the co-president of Lucati Asset Management. Lucati Asset Management is the asset management arm of Jefferies. Um, I remember when I joined Jefferies, there was just a few products on that platform and, and a few billion dollars, and today I think it's 20 products, $50 billion of assets, just a great growth story. Saul's role is really on strategy, on talent, uh, bringing it in, negotiating the deals, and, and getting them on the platform, and, and he's done a great job for us, and, and has been a great brand builder for us. So, with that, I will turn over to you, Saul and Rich. Uh, thanks, everyone. Good luck, dude. Good luck. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get started, I do have to tell you about my my two-second morning this morning. I was pretty psyched that my boss, you know, a couple weeks ago sent me a note and said, look, I'm, you know, I'm going to be speaking on this panel. You know, I'd love it if you'd interview me. I think it'd be great. And I was, you know, was kind of psyched. So this morning I get up and I'm, you know, I'm up early, right? Like I need to get here early and make sure that I'm not late and want to have some breakfast and have a coffee and make sure I'm ready to go. I get in the car, I put in Fountain Blue into Waze, and uh, I just start driving. I'm talking to my kids before they go to school. All of a sudden, I'm like, God, this, this doesn't look right. And uh, it says I'm one minute away. I've been on the highway for a while. I pull up. There is a Fountain Blue in Fort Lauderdale. This is not it. <laughs> um, I said, oh, shit. And uh, I went back to my ways and put in Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. It said 48 minutes away. Uh, and I would get there. That was 49 minutes ago. <laughs> so I made it. Uh, I was sweating. I had a rough morning, but we're here. Um, so obviously excited to, to spend some time here with Rich. And I think you know, before, we, before we get going into you know, your thoughts on, on the world, because I think that's what people are going to care about the most, you know, let's, let's just talk a little bit about your background. I'd love to hear about the young Rich Handler, where you grew up. I know you went to, uh, to college at the University of Rochester. I know you're obviously very involved. You're the board chair there. Can you just give us a little bit of background on where you grew up and how you ended up at Rochester and a little uh, bit of that? Very simple. I grew up in northern New Jersey. I'm a, New York Giants and Bruce Springsteen fan. Um, it's tough to be a Giant fan right now, but Bruce is touring, so that's pretty good. Um, I, my parents were, my mom was a mom. My dad prepared tax returns. We lived in a very normal middle class house. I've got three siblings. Uh, I went to the University of Rochester because you know I was really kind of, my, my parents just picked the school and said, this was pretty good, why don't you go there? I'm like, fine. So I just wound up going there for, out, of pure, you know, out of pure coincidence and I wound up loving it. And, uh, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And so now you're super involved in the school. How come? I, I love um, the, the, the next generations. I, I think a big part of being at Jeffries, a big part of being involved with education is really getting the next set of leaders going. And, I, and the school was very good to me. It prepared me well. I got a great education. I felt like uh, I was prepared for life. I, I, I started Wall Street afterwards. And uh, it's just a great chance to spend time with young people, which I still do today at Jeffries. That's awesome. First job, first Boston, 1983. What was the job? Why'd you take it? T tell us about it. 
Well, well, first off, I had to sneak in through the back door because they don't really recruit at the University of Rochester for, at First Boston. First Boston was a very white shoe, very prestigious firm at the time. It was Wasserstein and Perello were m and um, I, I got there and I was pretty surprised because everyone went from, to the exact same undergraduate school as usually Princeton, Harvard, or uh, Williams. Um, everyone, had, everyone was white, everyone was you know, male, everyone was very well dressed, and everyone knew they wanted to be an investment banker since they were like eight years old. And I looked around the firm and I learned a lot there, and there were a lot of good people there, but I watched the culture and the organization and they spent their entire time stabbing each other in the back. And I'm like, my gosh, this is Wall Street, this is kind of a wacky way to build a culture but it gave me a perspective of, of what I wanted to try to do going forward if I ever got a chance to be in a leadership position. And quite frankly, uh, at the time, First Boston, which by the way is coming back to be a new firm, First Boston, at the time, you know, way back in 1983, the Swiss were not happy with the Americans. The Americans were making a lot of money but only keeping it for themselves. There was no ROE. The market cap was about tens and tens of billions of dollars. And now you go through the last, you know, 40 years and now they're reemerging as a firm the size of Jeffries. It's, just a one, it's an amazing thing for me to watch uh, the evolution of an organization. And I, I do pay attention to culture. I pay attention to how people are treated. And it was a great experience for me, but it was very different from what I expected. Interesting. We'll get to culture in a little bit. So you decided to go to business school. You went to Stanford. Why? I mean, I know our generation, and I'm a little younger than you, actually a decent amount younger than you. Um, you know, that was sort of a thing. You did your two years, you went to business school. Now it seems like people aren't doing it as much. Um, why'd you go to business school and then younger people, what, what's sort of your advice on, on those two years? I, I mean, I went to business school at the time. If you want to stay in finance, that's what you did. And I, you know, I, I got into Stanford Business School and having grown up in northern New Jersey and went to school at University of Rochester, I thought of going to Palo Alto was very appealing. So that was, that was a big factor in it. But it also, you know, back then, uh, the, the quality of the people in my class, the chance to learn from my peers. If, if you can go to a very high quality school, I, I definitely recommend it. But it was a very different time than today, and I don't know if I would encourage it as much as today. Interesting. All right, now let's talk about Mike Milken, Drexel. That was your next job out of business school. Obviously, you know, you've got a, a super tight relationship with Mike today. Can you tell us about that? Tell us about what that place was like, working for Mike was like. Well, in the, in the summer of 1986, when I was in between my first and second years, it was the place to be. I mean, there was literally an X that marked the center of the financial universe, and everyone wanted to understand what was happening at Drexel. It was an up-and-coming, controversial, because they were just disrupting, before the word disruptor was actually being used, disrupting the financial world, and Mike was just remarkable. And I was in, they didn't take anybody into sales and trading. They only took people into... Um, investment banking, so I spent the summer there, and we weren't even allowed to go on the trading floor because the trading floor is where the secret sauce was, is a submarine sealed door, you couldn't go in there. But then what happened was after my summer in 1986, November, Boski Day hit, and that was when Ivan Boski turned state's evidence, and the whole firm was basically, you know, shaken to the core, and they took one person as an associate from the top 10 business schools, I was the one who was lucky enough at Stanford, and quite frankly, the other nine said, we're not going to go back because everyone was saying, you'll be tainted for life if you go back and work at Drexel. And all the folks at First Boston were telling me that too. And I go, you know what, I want to just try. And so I, I asked them to set up an interview with me and Mike. I got a job on the trading floor um, after a lot of effort because I think they were desperate to hire somebody. And I got there and then I wound up for four years literally seeing you know, Rupert Murdoch, Ted Turner, Steve Wynn, you know, you, you, Carl Icahn, you, you go through the list of who's who of entrepreneurs and mavericks, who, you know, Craig McCaw, who are changing industries, and I watched Drexel basically finance them in partnership, and it was an education in four years that, you know, you know I have a bunch of peers we were all, who were all there together. It was such an exciting and electric and hard working period of time, it was, it, was, it was great for me. That's incredible. Then you go to Jeffries. Well, well, I didn't just go to Jeffries. On, on a Friday, we're having a slight liquidity crisis. <laughs> and on Monday, there's a box at your desk, pack up, you know, the firm's closed. And so um, you know, that coincided with my five years out of business school. Um, they ask you, hey, what, what's the number one lesson you learned five years out of business school? 
And mine was, of course, there's no such thing as a slight liquidity crisis. And the fact of the matter is that experience was, was one of the most valuable things that could have ever happened to me because when you see a moment of inflection like that, you see the best in people, you see the worst in people, um, you, you know who you can count on. Um, literally, your world turns upside down, people scatter, and you learn how fragile everything in life is. And, you know, relationships are fragile, health are fra is fragile, um, trust is fragile, companies are fragile. Companies one day are there, the next day they're not there. And I've gone through a lot of ups and downs throughout my career, but that snapshot of time of seeing it firsthand really helped me, you know, put some of the pieces together to navigate when it happened to me. And I will say, at Jeffries at the time, you know, all the big firms who said we were, I was going to be tainted if I went to Drexel, all of a sudden they were offering me lots and lots of compensation to go. They decided I wasn't so tainted after all. And Jeffries, you know, was, was local. Um, they gave us $30 million worth of risk capital, which was all the risk capital in the firm, um, which, by the way, was a lot of risk capital for a 29-year-old. I couldn't believe they were trusting me with so much money. Um, there was no investment banking, no capital markets, no research, no fixed income, and they, it was just a riskless crossing of stocks in the third market. And Jefferies was a platform that allowed us to try to build something from scratch. And I always knew, you know, there was no one coming to Jefferies who was Mike Milken or capable of revolutionizing finance. But I always felt like if I didn't take the chance to try to be entrepreneurial at this point in time, when would I have a chance to do it? So I, I came over with 30 people, and we, we started you know, the, the, the high yield trading business from scratch. And just when I say from scratch, I was working on the liquidation of Drexel um, during the day, and at night, I was copying the holders list of all the high yield bonds that we had placed because that was our database that we had to use to try to trade bonds in the secondary markets. So this is before Bloomberg, this is before any kind of type of electronic system, but that was our big data and that's how we started you know, the, the bond trading business at you know, Jefferies. Amazing. So you became a CEO in 10 years. You know, did you always want to be a CEO? Like, how did that happen? Um, I never wanted to become a CEO. Um, it, it, you know, there, there's a couple of inflection points. You know, I, I remember in 1990, we had a holiday party at the end of the year, and we brought 32 people over. So with spouses, there were 64 people. And I realized, looking in the room, they asked me to make a toast. I'm 29. I'm with my wife, who's actually sitting right over there. And uh, yeah, I'm looking around the room, and I'm like, oh my god, these people actually think I know what I'm doing. Okay, <laughs> they, they, you know, their education of their kids, their mortgage payments, they're, they're, they're actually here. And, and you realize, you know, that privilege and sense of responsibility that you get from, from people trusting you. And I came to Jeffries to be an owner. You know, I was offered lots and lots of, of guaranteed compensation at bigger firms, but I was offered a very small salary at Jeffries with a percentage of what we produce and the right to take most of it in stock and be an owner. And I think being an owner is a very important aspect of any type of leadership. And so over the course of the 10 years, to get to your question, we were doing incredibly well. We were making a lot of money for ourselves, but the firm wasn't being integrated. It really wasn't um, standing for anything. Our culture was kind of, you know, every man or woman for themselves. And quite honestly, I wanted to be part of building something with partners that I was proud of. So um, not, not that there were bad people at Jefferies, but they had a different mentality. So I raised a fund within Jefferies, thinking I'm either going to leave and, and manage that fund, or I'll convince the senior management team to let me be more effective uh, at leadership at Jefferies. And the fact of the matter is, um, I wound up, you know, I wouldn't say I was selected, I was kind of you know, I selected, okay, and they, 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 they allowed, and we, there was a transition, and, and then I was really unprepared, because now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what the hell am I doing? I'm 39 years old, I'm really underqualified, and then, you know, all of a sudden the internet bubble bursts, and then 9-11 happens, and all hell breaks loose again, and again, I'll go back to you, understand how important it is to really be, you know, to be able to try to make a difference in really difficult times with people. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the next thing was probably the financial crisis, and that was really a, you know, where your, your relationship with Lucadia um, you know, was built. And, and uh, can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe walk us through the merger? Because I think 
probably don't understand. So, so I, I met Joe and Ian in 1987 at Drexel. They are two remarkable value investors. They're partners with Warren Buffett. They're incredibly smart. They're incredibly patient capital. They're incredibly impossible to deal with. They argue more with themselves than with you, and you're sitting there trying to negotiate with them, and you can't figure out what's going on. And I loved them from the start. And Ian has since passed away, and, and Joe is still um, our, our chairman at the Hold Co. today. Um, I'd always wanted them to be uh, on our board from 2000 to 2007 and three quarters. Um, but they, our stock was trading at two to three times book and they're value investors. So they're the ones who gave me the lead money to uh, start the fund that I was, I was possibly going to do on the outside. And in 2008, I wound up watching, you know, I, I, you know, if you listen to our conference calls, it was always the analysts saying, why aren't you levered up 40 to one like Lehman and Bear? Why don't you have 200% level three assets versus 3%? Why don't you have, uh, you know, why don't you have five to one debt to equity versus one to one? All the ratios that allow for 35 to 40% ROE, and I was always, hey, you know, one to one debt to equity, 3% level three, below 10 times leverage, and a mid-teens ROE is acceptable because I always went back to my experience with Drexel, and I always felt rule number one has to be do not blow up your company. And it sounds very obvious when you say it, but when I started, there were 500 investment banks. We we're number 497, and now we're between three and seven in almost everything that we do. It's not because we're geniuses. Most of them blew themselves up, okay? Most of them just disappeared um, primarily from arrogance. So I wound up going to Joe and Ian, watching what was going on, and I said, we need someone to validate our balance sheet. I know our ratios are good, but the rating agencies drive all the ability to bring long-term value, and it was a very serious inflection point, so I, I wound up selling them roughly uh, a third of our company uh, and got them on the board, and that allowed us to have the, the capital base to actually aggressively plan going forward, and so we hired about 2,000 people from 2008 to 2010 and three quarters because we were actually right-sized, and then all of the bigger firms either went bankrupt or became bank-holding companies in the middle on a Sunday night. And then take us through the merger in 2012. Um, the, the merger was basically, you know, usually in financial services mergers, one company buys another company for four times book. That company winds up having the same kind of people, so they fire half the people. There's a restructuring charge three years later, and it's a mess. That, that's how, and, and, and management makes a lot of money. That's how most financial service mergers have happened to that date prior. This was a stock for stock merger, okay? No one got paid a retention bonus because nobody wound up um, having a new boss. I wanted to hide, you know, the financial crisis was so rough on financial services company, companies. Lucadia had a beef company, a plastics company, a timber company, a, a, a healthcare company, and they had an investment bank. So we were hidden underneath all that crap because I wanted to hide and spend time with my partners building Jefferies, and the plan was to sell off those assets over the next 10 years and wind up investing that money in Jefferies and giving money back to the shareholders. And the, the, the thought process here that people don't understand is having an ownership mentality of protecting your company and protecting your people, um, that has to be the priority in a financial services company. And I look at what's happening today, it's not really a, a high priority. So I've known the firm and known you for close to 20 years now. Uh, I've been working with you pretty closely for five. I've been blown away at how flat your organization is. There's just not a lot of middle management, not a lot of people doing nothing seem to get discovered very quickly. Talk to us just a little bit about your, you know, the culture at Jefferies and really your management style. I didn't really have ownership of the company. And there wasn't a duration or, or, or continuity of leadership. So what would happen is every three to five years, there'd be another, there'd be a horse race between two people. One person would wind up winning. They'd get rid of all the other people who were on the other side. Then you wind up having a new strategic plan because the last strategic plan was somebody else's. And you have this process that goes through from year to year, decade to decade. And next thing you know, the organization has a hard time standing for something or having a culture that's cohesive or really know what kind of behavior is rewarded. We've been, we, you know, we've been blessed, and I, I've been through every single up and down, and I've made lots of the mistakes you mentioned, we made lots of them. Okay? None of them were, were mortal. Um, uh, you know, we, we wound up surviving them, but there were enough of, uh, a, there were enough people working together as a team to identify, elevate, 
escalate and deal with the issues. I mean, we, we had Archegos. Um, I, I was on vacation during COVID. I, I was literally um, hanging out, first vacation, you know, the phone rings. Uh, Pete Florenza, our head of uh, equities, calls up and says, we got this thing called Archie. He couldn't even say it. He couldn't even spell it, okay? I'm like, I'm like this is... I, I go, well, what is it? We, go, we don't really understand, but it was a prestigious client and prime brokerage and all. all. So I, I said, I'm going to go get a very nice little cocktail. I'm going to come back. You know, and I'm, you're just going to tell me uh, at the end of you know, you know, the, the day how much money we lost because I want it all gone. And so I came back. He goes, I go, how much? And he said this number, which was staggering to me. It was $28 million. And I'm like, we are idiots. I'm the worst CEO on the planet. We have no friggin' idea what we're doing, okay? I, I cannot believe I could, I'm on vacation my first time I came in C Street. That was on a Thursday night. And there's a Friday and a Saturday. I'm beating myself on a Sunday. Sunday night, so-and-so lost $2 billion. So-and-so lost $5 billion. So I'm like, I'm a genius. I'm the best CEO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. But <laughs> that happens, okay? But the fact of the matter is you've got to really have, and it's not that I was so smart, our people elevated it. They you don't shoot the messenger. You don't hide it. In 2015-16, you know, some firm said, we're shocked that you have high-yield bonds and distressed debt trading in your firm. Well, you know what? I, we do too, okay? We, you, know, you, don't, you don't shoot everybody because you have it. I mean, that was part of the business model. Yep. So a little plug for, for my business here, asset management business. You, you guys have made a big investment. Um, Talk to me about why. Why did you decide to get in this business? Why do you think it fits, fits in Jeffries? Are you excited about it? Oh, we're getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great being here. This is why he invited me. <laughs> um, look, we were, we, you know, when we did the merger with Lucadia, um, we were um, a hold co with a hodgepodge, and we were hiding, and that's what I wanted to do. That's what our whole management team wanted to do and catch our breath. And as we sold off the assets, we realized, as an organization, we have tremendous relationships with, with investors. We know a broad array of products and services. We um, have a reputable brand with Lucadia and Jefferies. We have all the infrastructure. And there's a lot of people who want to partner with us in raising third-party capital, but might not necessarily want to do it on their own or have the ability to put the critical amount of capital and infrastructure in place. So quite frankly, you, know, you, know, you and your partner, Nick, you know, we were able to convince you to basically leverage off the 5,000 people at Jefferies and all their relationships, all the flow that we see. We put our own money in. We have north of a billion and a half dollars in it ourselves. We help be flexible with the people who, how they want to run their business. And quite frankly, we're good partners, you know, meaning good partners to the people who are with us because asset management's tough, active management's tough, all aspects of it are tough. And it's just like, you know, when Drexel blow up, everyone's your friend when you're on top of the world. You only know if you have a good partner when things are slightly off sides. And, and no matter who you are in asset management, if you're marking your portfolio properly, you're going to have times when you're offside. And so, quite frankly, the, tr the thing is, how do you treat your partners? Is your own capital at risk? Are you picking the right people? Are you letting them be entrepreneurial? And you know, thus far, you know, we couldn't be more excited about where we are. Awesome. Thank you. So let's talk about the market. You know, what do you think this year and next year, capital markets? So... Um, the capital markets you know, have been pretty much shut for both leverage finance and you know, traditional leverage finance and equity businesses. And it's really a function of, you know, back in the last fall, you know, when we were, people were talking about rising interest rates, I looked around our company and I saw instead of, of the 5,000 people, there's like four of us who were around in 1994 who know what it's like to be in a rising interest rate environment. So I wrote this note, and I put it out on my Instagram. It says, a boomer's guide to rising interest rates, okay? And no one read it. Um, but then all of a sudden, you know, it, you know, things started to happen in the world. And what I saw in 1994 and lived through is, has many parallels of today. It's not 
the higher interest rate that's the problem. It's the transition from stupid, free, incredibly ridiculous money at zero cost with stimulus going crazy. I understand why both of those things happen, but those, that's not the real world. It's transition from low to something more normal. That's where all hell breaks loose, and that's where people cannot price risk appropriately. So you can't really price a high yield bond. You can't price an IPO. The leveraged finance market, you're buying first lien paper at 15%. There's no reason why you're gonna buy an equity if you have that kind of risk reward. And it's that interim period where all hell breaks loose. Now, you don't have to get to the actual ultimate rate for this to be fixed because the market will get a head, you know, will wind up anticipating it and you have capital formation again. And right now we're closer to the end of that than to the beginning. You can see as the rate of increases start to decrease and you can see the mood set, we will have a normalization of rates. I can't tell you if it's four and a half, five, five and a quarter, wherever it's gonna be, it's gonna be. I can't tell you exactly when it's gonna be, but the world will survive when it gets there. And you know, triple C high yield bonds don't have to trade at five and a half percent, okay? Risk reward is gonna work. There'll be, you know, there'll be cycles again in terms of restructurings. You know, the natural, the, the natural cost of, of cycles will occur. We have people in our company, senior people who've been in our business for 10 years who've never experienced a real cycle. And that's actually a great time for stock pickers. It's a great time for investment banks that give real service and industry expertise and capital formation, but it's painful in that transition. So I'm very optimistic we'll get there. In the meantime, it's not a lot of fun. So you touched on your Instagram. You know, you're pretty active on social media, especially for someone that's as high profile as you are. What's the thought process there? It's like four or five years ago, my daughter started making fun of me on her Instagram account. And yeah, I guess I'm pretty ridiculous at times. And so I go to meetings with banking clients and our bankers are very stuffy, like everyone's bankers are stuffy and they have pitch books like this and they're all very formal. And I go to the meetings with our, client, with our, with our bankers and before the meeting would start, you know, the CEO would say, uh, my daughter follows your daughter and tell me about your floating picnic table. And my whole, all my bankers are, next to me are like, what the hell's going on here? And, the, and we never even used the pitch book, but it really personalized things. Then I, I, I stumbled into this thing called these, these financial meme accounts. And I noticed a couple of interesting things. Number one, they are really, really funny. And number two, there's parts of them that were really, really nasty and mean. And so I, I, and I, then I realized this is how this whole generation you know, is really communicating, or one of the ways they're really communicating with each other. So I started posting some comments you know, not quite being quite as nasty and kind of calling out the nastiness and giving another perspective to actually talk about it. And the, all of a sudden, you, what you saw in these rooms is the, the, the younger people started to stand up for the right way, you know, and not in every case. I get lots and lots of hate DMs. Don't trust me. Don't, 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 don't uh, kid yourself. But it changed the tone in the, in the conversations, and I started connecting with a lot of people. And, it, and what, what you learn is when you, you know, this is the future generation, okay? And, and when we were going through COVID and we, when we bought Pelotons for our, you know, our juniors, and I asked how many Pelotons we bought to reward them for working nonstop, and they said like 1,800, okay, out of 5,000 people. You realize my company that I work for is not the same company I thought it was. It's a much younger, much more vibrant, uh, much more unique from an age perspective. And if we don't connect with that group of people and understand what's going on in their heads and be good mentors to them, and you know, I, do, I do a lot of Q&A, mostly going through every mistake I've made through my career, and it's, if someone else has the benefit of not repeating my exact mistake, and I try to encourage all of our leaders at Jeffries to do it, I think it's a great medium to do it, and it's kind of fun. It's awesome. And my, and, and, and my general counsel, who is not thrilled with this, he does not um, like it. Here's the good news, this is a small crowd. He doesn't understand there's this thing called Instagram stories, okay? He just thinks it's Instagram. Okay, so he thinks I've really calmed down and I've stopped posting, so let's just keep that. Yeah, we won't tell him. <laughs> That's good, they disappear, I like that. All right, so we're, we're running out of time here. I got two more quick questions for you. You, you spend a lot of time with, with young people, you know, giving them advice. Young people in the crowd here, if you're giving them advice, what, what, what is it? What's so two things. First off, 
I don't necessarily just give them advice. I learn from them. I, I learn more from them than I think they learn from me. So it, it, it's, it's a very much a two-way street. But if, if I had to give one piece of perspective for them, it's, you know, it goes back to this thought process of being an owner of your career, okay, and your life. And, you know, and, and putting yourself in a position where you're surrounded by people who care about you at work, um, who will teach you, who will take a real interest in you. It doesn't mean you don't have to work really hard. I would say find the right balance in your life. Uh, uh, no matter what you're doing, you have to find time to exercise. You have to find time for your parents and for your, your friends and families. I always tell them the most important thing is to find the right life partner. Okay? You find the right life partner, you have someone to celebrate when things are, are great, and you have someone to you know, to pick you up, help pick you up when things are really rough. And, you know, that balance and that ownership and having the passion to do what you want to do and not follow the herd. You know, everyone wanted to run to Drexel and then all of a sudden it wasn't popular, everyone ran away from Drexel. No one was going to Jeffries, okay? You know, it, now people want to come to Jeffries. Independent thought, assessing the situation, asking questions, trying to be you know, whole, you know, you try to see the whole picture, and I'd say the last thing is be long-term oriented, okay? This thing where you have juniors come out of college to get a job in investment bank, but they don't want to be an investment bank, they want to be in private equity, but they don't want to be in private equity, they want to be an uh, MBA, but they don't want to be an MBA, they want to be a tech, uh, they have the next nine years planned out, you know, before they even start. And I'm a big believer, you know, try to, whatever you're doing, act like it's gonna be your career, You'll do better at it no matter what. If it's not your career, you'll, you'll wind up having skills. And guess what? It might wind up being your career. It's a great answer. And our last question. If you didn't work in this business, what would you have done? <laughs> that wasn't on the script. <laughs> you know, I'm tone deaf, but man, Bruce Springsteen, a rock and roll star. Okay, we, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had a leadership offsite and they played Surrender by Cheap Trick and I got on stage and I was tone deaf, but I got the moves, I know the words. Um, uh, in all seriousness, I, 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 I think at this stage in my life, if I wasn't doing it, it'd be mostly working with um, future generations and trying to and be mentor. I, I, I have this amazing scholarship program with kids at Rochester, and we give kids who have overcome the most incredible odds in, in their lives, just obstacles beyond obstacles, but they're also the smartest and most talented. And we are surrounded by those kids. And my clients, they work with my clients, they work at Jeffries, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're, they're being around that generation and the people in our company who are young and trying to figure out some smart way to give back, I think that's what I would do. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming and listening. Thank Appreciate you. It.